Michael. My name is Tyler Boyce. I'm a public policy professional here in Ottawa and I'm really excited to interview you today. But before we get started, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I am a criminal defense lawyer here in the city of Ottawa. I work with a firm called LMS Lawyers where I am one of the senior lawyers at the firm. I've been practicing in the area of criminal law nearly about 20 years now and I also teach at the University of Carleton and one of the courses I teach is youth and, and criminal law for the third year third year students. Uh, you and I are going to talk about the Youth Criminal Justice Act which came into effect in April of 2003. Uh, prior to it coming into effect I was on a working group that assisted with the um, critique and the feedback and some of the areas within that that legislation before it came to came to pass in 2003. And I know today that we're going to be talking for the benefit of young people, but for families and more so immigrant families. Uh, I'm happy to do that, happy to share this with you because I'm the product of, uh, of an immigrant family. So I came to Canada as a, as a young person. And so a lot of the information that we're going to talk about today is information I wish that my parents and that I had when, when, we were, when we were growing up. So I'm looking forward to our time together today and looking forward to the questions that you're going to be asking me. I'm looking forward to it as well. Right. Yeah, so it can be a really stressful time um, when, with youth um, entering the criminal justice system. And we know that it's not just a stressful time for that particular youth, but for their family as well. And there are several different compounding um, factors that, that play into that. Um, for example, if you're a new immigrant family, navigating the system can be quite hard. So I think a good place for us to start um, it's hopefully if you can tell us a little bit about the criminal, the youth criminal justice system in particular, maybe a bit, a bit about it, its history to start. Sure, absolutely. And I think that's, that's an important point. And you're right, it can be extremely stressful for families, particularly parents. So our youth criminal justice system goes back a number, number of years. We started off with the, what they call the Juvenile Delinquency Act, worked our way up to the Young Offenders Act in 1984, and then in 2003, the Youth Criminal Justice Act, or the YCJA, became the new piece of legislation that helped or dealt with young people. And the Youth System, or Youth Criminal Justice System Act, works differently because the focus is more so on rehabilitation, reintegration of young people back out into the community. Understanding, of course, that sometimes young people find themselves in trouble with the law. We understand that for what it is, but even when they get into trouble, we want to give them the resources, we want to get them through the system so they can reintegrate back into society. So that's pretty much the focus and an important difference in our criminal uh, youth system. Definitely. Um, I'm hoping you can maybe expand a little bit on that rehabilitation piece. What, what does a successful rehabilitation uh, look like? So first of all, it begins with identifying what the issue may be for the young person. So a young person gets into a fight at school, okay? And so we, we, we want to know, we just don't want to punish them and say, okay, you got into a fight, you assaulted someone at school, you're going to go to a jail for a couple of months. We want to find out what's the root cause of that. So are there anger issues that they need to be dealt with? And so the rehabilitation aspect of it, it focuses more on identifying what the issue is and then providing the young person with the resources to tackle those issues. And what is very much different about the YCJA is that the, on the rehabilitation side, the counselors or youth workers will work a lot to get the family involved because they recognize that you know, the youth young person may not be able to do it all on their own. So if they have that community support or family support, it would help their rehabilitation process. So that's really helpful. And uh, I understand there's a difference between the youth criminal justice system and then there's the um, adult criminal justice system, right? There is. I, see, I, I'm learning something. <laughs> yeah. So maybe you could tell me a little bit more about um, the differences between those two systems. Maybe there's a difference in terms of the values. I know that they, they came up through different pieces of legislation. Yes. But I'm sure that there are more differences. There are, because as I mentioned earlier, the purpose behind, the key purpose behind the Youth Criminal Justice Act is one, accountability for the young person and then the rehabilitation, the reintegration. And so what we see with the Youth Criminal Justice Act, that the young person they get a few more chances to get it right. Whereas as an adult, you, you would not. So once you're in trouble, you're in a different system. So let me give an example. A young person gets into trouble, same charge, let's say, as an adult would get. Chances are that young person is going to get released on bail to go back to their, to their family 
whereas in the adult may go through the system a little bit longer for that for that purpose. I mean, another key difference in terms of between the youth and the adult, because we recognize that young people can be impulsive, they they do things without thinking, they may be more subjected to peer pressure, and so they make these mistakes, which are criminal when they're young. Well, the law allows for a period of time, if they rehabilitate and they reintegrate, then that record or whatever they did becomes sealed after a number of years. And so what it does in effect is give the young person a chance to, to move on with life after they're 18 or 19. So they're not saddled with, I did something silly when I was a young person, and now I have to carry that for the rest of my life, which will impact maybe if they want to go to certain schools, they want to get into certain programs, or they want to work in certain areas. It, it wouldn't limit them because of the Youth Criminal Justice Act. Yeah, I like I like what you say around um, it wouldn't saddle them with the kind of that that stamp. It gives there's the the chance to continue forward with their lives and understand that you know a mistake was made. Yes. Um, but everybody deserves a second chance. Yeah. And I think that that does apply for folks regardless of their age. Yes. But it's um, incredibly important that we keep that value strong for for our young people. Absolutely. Just because, as I said, the minds develop a lot differently, and a lot of the the Youth Criminal Justice Act, it tries to align with the development of the young person, recognizing that they are impulsive and they are they may be subjected more to the peer pressure. So there are a lot more opportunities for them to really have a second chance or a third chance. And a lot of resources are provided or available to the young persons. And not only them to directly, but also the, the families, because the law recognizes that they need that familial support. So it's there for them. So let, let's let's uh, continue forward on that piece about the families. Yes. So we've acknowledged already in this conversation that when a young person gets into the gets into trouble with the law, um, that it affects not just that one individual, but the family, the extended family, yes. and oftentimes maybe even the community. Yes. So maybe um, I'd like to ask you, what is some advice you would give to parents looking to support the a young their child who is right. navigating the youth criminal justice system? The key piece of advice is get help. So for a lot of the parents I've dealt with, it's it's a first time for them and they're trying to navigate this particular system without the knowledge and the background. And depending on the community that they come from, language can also be a barrier. So the key thing or key message I would say is make sure you get some advice, you get to that lawyer and you allow that lawyer to do the work that they're, they're going to do. Exactly what we're doing now, educate them themselves about what is available for families and, and young people in terms of in terms of resources. So that's the key message I would I would say to to, to a parent. Really? So when you, you say the role of the lawyer, let the lawyer do the lawyering. Yes. Maybe you can expand it. Sure. So my my focus on my work as a lawyer is to advise my my client. I represent that person and effectively to help them get through the system or the process in giving them advice. Ultimately they make the final decision but typically what we get with a 15, 16 year old is say, look, I don't know what to do, Michael, so you direct me, and that's what I do. It can be easier sometimes. Um, other times it can be challenging if parents who are unaware of how the system works, because they're parents, they want to intervene, they want to be involved. And so they may try to give the young person advice, which is different than what me as a lawyer is giving. So for example, as a lawyer, one of the first things I would say to a young person when he or she gets into trouble, okay, I do not want you talking to the police. I want you to exercise your right to remain silent because we do not know what the information is that they have. We don't know what we're working against. So before we say anything, let's just maintain that silence. That's what I say as a lawyer, and that's the advice I typically give and will give about nine and a half times out of ten. A parent comes from a different perspective, and they may say, tell them everything they need to know because you need to tell the truth, right? That may not assist me in what I'm doing. Not that I don't want the young person to say the truth. I just don't want them to talk until it is time for them to talk where it's beneficial to them. And so it's important for the parents to be aware of that and to know their role and to play that role. I never blur the line, so I'm not telling the young person you know, you shouldn't be committing crimes and I'm not going to be coming down on them because that's not my role. That's the role of the, of the of the parent or the guardian. So it's important for the parents and me to play our roles. And as, as the kids say, play your position. And so that's what I do. I play my position. I tell parents they should play their position. 
So we've talked about playing your position and a really important position being played to help youth navigate the youth criminal justice system is the, is the role of a lawyer, right? Yes. Um, maybe you could tell me a little bit more about additional supports that are there. So one of the biggest challenges that we find is how do people pay for a lawyer? A young person, my 15, 16 year old client doesn't have the resources to pay the legal fees. The families in a situation where they can't afford it because it can be expensive depending on how far you go. Yeah. We are fortunate in Ontario and even within Canada that we have a legal aid system. So the system will allow for that young person to pick his or her lawyer and the system will pay for that lawyer. So the young person or their family don't have to pay money out of pocket, which I find reduces a lot of stress. I mean, families and young people are going through a lot of stress as it is the uncertainty of the outcome of the particular case and what it's going to mean. And so if we can take one of those stresses off by having the, the fees paid for, that is an important thing that works well for, for the young person. In terms of the rehabilitation that we talked about earlier, we have youth workers within the ministry who will work with the young person. So for example, a young person will get arrested and they will end up in a facility here in Ottawa. It's the William E. Hay Center and they will go there. The minute that person, that young person is there, automatically there's a probation officer who will reach out to them and say, what resources do you need? Do you need me to assist you connecting with certain things? So that happens. We have the Youth Services Bureau, which will, this is a, an organization here within the city of Ottawa that young people can connect with. So they can go into various programs if they need help and resources in terms of uh, counseling, USB will, will assist them with all that. If the young person maybe has addiction issues, we have the Dave Smith Youth Treatment Center, which is a residential program. So there are wider range and array of resources available for young people in the city of Ottawa. So out of all of those types of um, resources that you've mentioned, um, it sounds like some of them support youth once they're in the criminal justice system. Yes. Some of them support youth um, to, to exit the criminal justice system. Yes. Um, could you maybe focus in a little bit on some of the ones that are more upstream? So the preventative services. It's, it's, that's a little bit more of a challenge because mm -hmm. how do you identify if someone, you know, you have young people and go, okay, well, you're going to be a bad person. You're going to get into crime. And so the, the focus in that regard is more so on the education, yeah. right? And so certain things that could get you in trouble, where to stay away from. And so in the state of Ottawa, there's crime prevention, Ottawa and organizations who provide resources and toolkits to educate not only the young people, but also their families in that regard. In Ottawa, we, we also have, there's a program called On Point, which is more geared towards the young person who is being, maybe being pulled towards more of the gang, the street gangs type of, type of side. And so if and when a parent, a family member, or a worker, a community worker, maybe identifies this as a concern uh, for it, then that person can refer the young person to, the, uh, to those programs. Um, so before we end up off this wonderful conversation, um, I'd like maybe to give you the opportunity to tell me a little bit more about um, anything really from the rehabil rehabilitation process or if there are certain pieces of advice from your expertise that you'd like our, our families listening at yes. home to know. Absolutely. I would say, as I said earlier, get educated. And I think what we're doing here as a resource tool is phenomenal because young people need to know their rights. The parents need to know the rights and the beauty about the Youth Criminal Justice Act is that both parent and youth have rights. So for example, I'd spoken earlier about the right to remain silent. So the young person has that right. The young person has a right to a phone call to talk to a lawyer. The difference, when you asked me earlier the difference between the adult and the youth system, the every individual who gets arrested gets a phone call. That's under the Charter of Rights and, and Freedom that we have here in Canada. The distinction, however, is that the young person not only gets a, a phone call to a lawyer, but they also, the police officers must, as a right, they must notify the guardian or the parent. So nothing is supposed to be happening. Young person should not be, be questioned unless the young person has that right to make and the implementation of that phone call. Further to that, the young person can say, you know what, not only do I want to talk to mom or dad or aunt or uncle or cousin, whoever it may be, the elder, I want that person in the room. I want them down at the police station. And so as a right, the police officer would have to wait until the parent arrived at the police station before they engage in the interview process 
with a young person. That's not something we'll see in the adult system. That's specifically to, uh, to uh, young people. And that, and that support for young people to have in the room is incredibly important. It is. Um, and it's in line. It's in line with the Youth Criminal Justice Act because we talk about, as I told you earlier, we know that the young person may be impulsive. They don't think about their their actions so much. So imagine now being in that stressful situation where an officer may be answering question. So maybe you want or need that that adult in the room to say, well, wait a minute, you're a little bit too harsh with my with my son or my niece or nephew or my daughter. Right, let's just slow things down. And so that's an extremely important right that they have. So we were talking a little bit about the rights and responsibilities of, of parents trying to support um, their child yes. uh, not to navigate the youth criminal justice system. So I was wondering if you could tell me a bit more about some of the, the supports that are there, some of the, some of the advice that you would give to these parents. Yes, and we talked about the right to a phone call, right to have the guardian or parent present. And I say right, I say guardian or parent because sometimes I see answer uncles who may be taking care of the of the young person. And so just so we're clear, the law just doesn't say it has to be a parent, it's a parent or a guardian. So someone in, in that position of authority. And one of the things that I, I find certainly within the community, sometimes the language barrier becomes an issue where either the young person or the parent or guardian, they're unable to communicate in, in English well enough to understand what's going on. So the law does allow for the young person to be able to have an interpreter okay. available with them or to them when they're at, when they're speaking with the police. That also extends to the parent or guardian. And I would say to any parent or guardian, if you feel uncomfortable with respect to the language and not understanding what's going on, stop, slow things down and let the officer know, I'm the parent or guardian. I'm here because as a right, I'm supposed to be here, I want to be here, but I do not understand what's going on because of language. They have interpreters on call. They have what's called uh, language of life interpreters uh, who are available within the system that they can access. So I would say to a young person, to a parent or a guardian, if you do not feel comfortable because it's not your first language, then ask for an interpreter before things progress. And that interpreter, just to be clear, is free. It's paid for not by the parent or the, or the guardian or the family. It's paid for by by. By the system. By the system. It is. And just so we are also clear, interpreter, they're not going to allow for mom or dad to do the interpretation because that's not part of the system. It has to be one where if the officer is asking questions or there's a communication, it has to be a credible or a designated, you know, interpreter. Um, so I want to I want to jump back to a point we talked about earlier um, and ask for some advice that you would give for um, for when we're when we're stopped when young people are stopped. So we know that there's been quite the debate around yes. carding. We know how carding really affects our communities in a particular yeah. way in this province. So maybe some advice for when you are stopped by the police. Um, how do we how do you navigate that situation yeah. in a safe way? We've been talking a lot about the education and so it's important for the young people and the parents and families to educate themselves. And so there are essentially two scenarios that an individual may find themselves in realistically. So when you're talking about being stopped, so they may be in a vehicle. So they may be the driver, they may be a passenger, or they may be just walking in their neighborhood, walking down the street. I would say to that young person, be mindful of the situation. And by that I mean that, yes, you are interacting with a police officer, and the police officer in a uniform with all their gear and equipment may be, may be controlling the, the scenario, but you too are able to control that situation because you're able to control yourself and how you respond to the circumstance. I've never found it helpful, you know, when I'm reading these files or speaking to my client, when I read, oh, the young person starts, you know, swearing or being belligerent to the, to the officer. That's not helpful. If a young person does not feel comfortable or the parent doesn't even feel comfortable if they're there, engage with the officer, then say that. Communicate that to the officer. Say, look, I do not feel comfortable or I feel uncomfortable now in terms of what's going on and help de-escalate that situation. Parents and young people need to know that they do have the ability to de-escalate or to defuse the situation. And it's not uncommon for us to see a situation that where an officer is doing his or her job, no fault of the officer, but then where it escalates into something more so than anyone ever imagined and where they're either injured significantly and or even shot. We've seen that all throughout. So we need to be mindful of that and parents and young people need to be mindful of that. Definitely. It uh, can be a heated, dangerous situation um, with all the, the, the machinery that comes along with, um, with, with the system involved. 
And so, emotions, and emotions, and right? emotions. So it's incredibly important. You have to like have that that catchphrase. Yeah. Um, I'm hearing that the best way for young, for youth involved with the criminal justice system, for youth that are being carded, yeah. the best thing for them to do is to express how they're feeling, which yes. is to say, I am not comfortable. Yes. And that puts you in a position as a lawyer to support them best when you're reading that transcript and hearing that, you know, this young person said that they were uncomfortable or the parent or guardian said yes. they're uncomfortable. Yes. Why did it go any further than after that that, that emotion was expressed? Right? Yeah. The police officers are going to continue to do their job and I think that's what they're going to say to you. But it's important for me on my end that be captured because police are required to note what's happening. They're, they're required to take notes of their interaction with the, with the young person. And then that, that is provided to me as the lawyer through what we call the disclosure process. So it's important for me to know that the young person understands what these rights are and that they're communicating that within an, in an effort not to obstruct the police or to avoid the investigation, but to make sure that they're comfortable and that they're exercising their rights. Definitely, I appreciate it, Michael. Um, I want to jump back into another point that we had talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, so right now we've been talking about kind of the, the preventative piece, kind of like at the beginning, you know, that first interaction. Maybe we can go to the other side of it and you can let me know what it actually looks like on the ground yeah. when you are when a youth is exiting the youth criminal justice system. What, what are those steps? So it, it differs for the youth and differs in terms of the the charges or the snare that they, that they found themselves in, and it also depends upon the family unit and the support that they have. But I would go back and say that, as we talked about earlier, there are so many resources available. And if and when that young person decides, you know what, this life isn't for me. You know, my cousin got shot, my friend got shot, or someone got killed, or someone's in jail now for a long time, and I, they, they want out, there is that exit. And an exit strategy can be created with the, with the assistance of youth workers and the community support. It's, it's available there for them. So for a young person, we have probation officers or what we call youth workers um, who are wonderful. And the, the, we're very fortunate here in Ottawa that our probation officers, they, they are plugged in. They understand the, the, the dynamic. They spend time with the families and that's what you need. And they, they work a lot to develop that trust with the young person. And because they learn about the person, their family, they're better able to direct them to the right resources that will help the young person exit strategy. So when you talk about exiting, there, I think there are two things that we should be looking at. So there's a difference between someone who wants to, who's your charge and you're actually going through the process and you want to get out, right? So you do have your youth workers and you're talking, there's also that other side of it where the young person's already had their charges dealt with. And so they're no longer in the system per se that there's an active charge going on or active case going on but they want out. On both of those tracks, they would still be able to access places like the Youth Services Bureau. Their officer, their probation officers may still be engaged or still be involved in that process. So there's that ability. And as I mentioned earlier, the law works where, so when the young person you know, does decide, hey, I want to be good, I don't want to be in the system anymore, um, there's a section in the legislation that allows for the, their records to be sealed. So no one can go back and look at it and go, okay, what did this person do when, when they were younger to try to use that against them? In fact, it's very difficult to you know, unseal that once it is sealed. I think that's a wonderful note to kind of to end the conversation on, on the fact that the, within the youth criminal justice system, there is the opportunity to give these young people a second chance by sealing that record. Yes. Um, I want to thank you so much for your time um, and also for the knowledge that you brought to this conversation, Mike. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.